Great, Anne, and just confirming you're gonna send me the name of the first speaker. Um, Doing so right now, Ryan. <laughs> excellent, thank you. And Benita, are you the list, the, the, the lead? No, I'm listener number three. Benita. Um, Benita. Oh, yes. Benita. Oh, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> I'm listener number one. Yes. Thank you. you all look great. We're looking forward to starting soon. Um, Cadmus, were you able to get the live stream going? Yes, the live stream is going. So are we all set? Um, you guys ready? Um, and are you ready on your end? I think we're ready. ready on my end. All right, let's get started. Great, I'll go ahead and close the waiting room so everyone can join. Good morning, everyone. We'll give folks just about one more minute, just for the last couple of folks to join, and we'll get started. Okay. Welcome to the revised Lynn Copper Rule public listening session. My name is Ryan Albert and I'll be facilitating today's session. If you haven't already, we invite you to view the EPA administrator's video message on the importance of these engagements to the agency. It can be found at www.epa.gov backslash safe water. Once again, that's www.epa.gov backslash safe water. We also encourage you to watch the lead and copper rule 101 video, which can also be found at www.epa.gov backslash safe water. This session is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. Before we begin, I would like to introduce representatives from EPA who are here today to listen to your comments. For this session, we have Benita Best Wong, Jennifer McLean, and Anita Tompkins. Benita, would you like to say a few remarks? Good morning, everyone. My name is Benita Best Wong, and I'm the Deputy Assistant Administrator here in the Office of Water. I work very closely with Radhika Fox, our Principal Deputy Assistant Administrator, and the Senior Leadership in Water to implement the Clean Water Act as well as the Safe Drinking Water Act. I'm, I'm happy to be here today to listen to your comments and to hear your thoughts on the lead and copper revised rule. We are looking forward to listening and learning from you today. With that, I'd like to introduce my colleagues who are here with me today to serve as listeners so that they can introduce themselves and say a few words. Um, Jennifer. Thank you, Benita. Good morning, I'm Jennifer McLean. I'm the director of the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water. And this is the office and the Environmental Protection Agency that has the scientists and the engineers and policymakers that develop the revisions to the lead and copper rule and guidance for water utilities and communities. Protecting people from lead and drinking water is a top priority at EPA. And we're very much look, looking forward to the input that we're going to be receiving from you all today. Um, thank you very much for spending your time with us today. Bye. Benita. Thank you, Jennifer and Benita. Uh, good morning, folks. My name is Anita Tompkins. I am the Drinking Water Protection Division Director uh, in the Office of Groundwater and Drinkwater in EPA. Um, thank, I'm such a privilege to be here to listen to, to you all. Uh, my division is responsible for the implementation of the Safe Drinking Water Act, which would include the implementation of these lead and copper rule revisions. Looking forward to hearing your comments today. Thank you. Thank you, Benita, Jennifer, and Anita. Now I'm going to go over a few ground rules. Each participant is allotted three minutes to make their comments. 
Your adherence to this time allocation will allow all participants an equal opportunity to provide their comments. When it is your scheduled time, I will call your name and invite you to unmute your microphone so that you may begin your statement. At that time, please make sure to unmute your microphone on Zoom as well as the computer or phone you are joining from. If I cannot hear you, I will let you know. If possible, please consider turning on your camera if you are comfortable doing so. When you have one minute left, I will turn back on my camera and you should begin to wrap up your statement. I will give you a verbal warning at 30 seconds and we'll hold up a red card when you have 10 seconds left. At this time, I will, uh, when your time is up, I will let you know, and at this point, we will mute your microphone. If you're joining by telephone, I will give you a verbal warning at 30 seconds and when your three minutes are up. Again, to ensure that everyone who signed up for this session is able to speak, we ask that you keep within the time limit and keep your comments focused on lead in drinking water and the revised lead and copper rule. We thank you for your interest and look forward to hearing your input. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the speakers. And our first speaker is Maureen Hartwell from Pennsylvania. Maureen, if you're there. Good morning. Am morning. I good to begin? We, we can hear you, so please begin. Okay, perfect. Good morning. My name is Maureen Hartwell, Health Policy Fellow at the Pittsburgh-based nonprofit Women for a Healthy Environment. Since 2009, we have been educating individuals about environmental exposures, providing resources to communities, and advocating for primary prevention policies. A health protective lead and copper rule is of utmost concern as an organization serving Southwest Pennsylvania. In a report released just two weeks ago, our organization analyzed Allegheny County's water systems on the basis of lead content and risk communication transparency. We found that 80% of water systems in the county had detectable levels of lead and over 20% reported partial replacements on the public side, leaving lead service lines on the private side. Because there is no safe level of lead, any detectable level is a reason for concern. There is broad consensus that partial replacements can incur short-term increases in lead levels in drinking water. What's more, studies now indicate that in the long term, these partial replacements do not decrease the levels of lead. In order to make an earnest pursuit of public health, we recommend the following regarding lead service line replacements. In conducting replacements, environmental justice communities as defined by the EPA's EJ index and those with the highest rates of childhood lead poisoning must be prioritized. Additionally, full lead right. service line replacements must be implemented and proactively as a means to lead service lead safe systems rather than emergency management. We join other public health leaders in recommending the replacement of all lead service lines within 10 years. Finally, we implore you to prohibit partial lead service line replacements under any circumstance. Water systems are present in environmental justice communities and communities of color with low income households. They face a lack of resources such as funds to replace lead lines and in some cases, full-time staff members. These systems tend to have higher levels of lead and fewer means to mitigate its presence in the community. It's critical to invest in these systems and afford them the financial resources necessary to protect the public's health. Our report found that 64% of water systems in Allegheny County do not publicly provide information on lead to their websites. As such, we also recommend the following changes to boost transparency for consumers. First, during the inventory process, all leaded parts of a piping system must be disclosed to the ratepayer. This includes goosenecks, pigtails, or other connectors made of lead. And second, while we support the new requirement for complete inventories of public and private lines, we believe that all water authorities must also make their inventories available electronically for the public. Lastly, compliance under these revisions should happen in 2022. We must not delay these critical needs. We believe these recommendations will improve the environmental health conditions for our most vulnerable communities. Thank you for your time today. Maureen, thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Valerie Barron from Washington, DC. Valerie, are you there? 
I'm here. That's just wonderful. Thank you. You may begin speaking. With you. Great. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Valerie Barron, and I am a resident of Washington, D.C., where I've been deeply involved in the lead and drinking water issue. I'm also a senior attorney at the Natural Resources Defense Council. And the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, we have a lot of specific recommendations about what we believe needs to happen with the lead and copper rule. But what I really wanted to do today is share a little bit of what I observe as a mom of two small kids who lives in Washington, DC and how it came to this issue and the types of things that I see, because I, I think that perspective is really valuable in understanding the urgency of this issue. I came to this issue not through, not first through my day job, although I have been working professionally to curb childhood lead exposure for more than 10 years, um, but as a neighborhood commissioner, Washington DC has a system of around 300 volunteer elected official neighborhood commissioners. And I was in my nights and evenings serving as an ANC commissioner here in DC. When DC Water came to my commission meeting to present their plans to put um, new pipes in the ground. And what they presented at my commission meeting didn't pass the small test. So, you know, I started digging around and brought the paperwork into work. And that's how I professionally became involved in lead service line replacement. They were adding new partial lead service lines to the system without adequate education of customers of my constituents. I live in an area of DC where the utility um, put new partial lead service lines into the ground. My block has one of the highest densities of lead, partial lead service lines in the district. And ever since that time in 2017, I've been working on this in my personal and professional capacity. I serve on DC Waters Stakeholder Alliance, a group put together by the utility to advise them. I've worked with DC Council and of course, through my day job. Some of the things that I see here in Washington, D.C. are that, you know, we had a, and many of you may recall, we had a, um, a national crisis. Our lead levels in the water here about 20 years ago after some pH changes in the water were 30, 40 times that in Flint. But our pipes are still in the ground. Um, we now test our children for lead. Our children are the guinea pigs rather than requiring that the pipes get removed. Every kid gets a lead test. And I cannot tell you how many of my former, formerly constituents and my friends come to me and say that their kids have a blood lead level. And there's a lot of misconceptions about where that might come from. There's a lot of talk about, oh, well, it might be dust, it might be paint. And of course, those are sources of lead that we have to remediate. But I'll tell you, nine times out of 10, when they come to me with this problem, there's a lead pipe or a partial lead pipe in their house. The changes that EPA has the opportunity to make here um, really can solve this problem. We need to get the lead pipes out. We need accurate information. We need people to know that if they have a lead pipe, that the first bit of exposure for them um, as adults or also for their children is the most potent. And- um, Please. And we need to we need to finally get all these pipes out of the ground and solve this problem. Great, thank you, Valerie. Just one moment. Okay, so our next speaker is Salome Freud from New York. Hi, can you hear me? We can, but barely. Do you mind speaking up just a little? Is that better? That's better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm Salome Freud from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Um, the New York City, City of New York appreciates this opportunity to comment on the lead and copper rule revisions. The Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, is the city's agency with primary responsibility for operating, maintaining, and protecting the public water supply that provides high quality drinking water to nearly half the population of the state of New York, over 9 million people. New York City takes tremendous pride in the quality of its water supply and the service DEP provides to millions of people every day. New York City water is lead free when delivered from the city's upstate reservoir system and water quality tests show that the vast majority of homes in the city have lead concentrations in full compliance with federal standards. 
However, some older residents have lead in their privately owned service lines and other plumbing materials. DEP has been conducting lead research for decades and has an active corrosion control program to reduce the leaching of lead from these materials into the water. New York was also one of the first cities in the nation to offer free lead testing to provide customers with information they need to reduce lead exposure. Replacement of lead service lines is the most effective way to minimize public exposure to lead, which is why New York City has replaced all city-owned lead service lines. We agree with EPA that removing all remaining sources of lead is important and that the cost of replacing privately owned lead service lines should fall on the homeowners, not be borne by water systems. The city also supports enhanced public education and outreach. However, the proposed implementation of a broad tier one public notification for an exceedance of the 15 micrograms per liter action level is inappropriate. The intent of a tier one notification is, quote, notify people who may drink the water that there is potential for an immediate impact to human health, end quote. Since risks of lead exposure are limited to locations with lead sources, notifications should be focused on those customers who are actually at risk. A tier one citywide notification would needlessly alarm millions of people who have zero exposure to lead, erode public confidence in the public water supply, and likely drive many customers towards bottled water, resulting in the needless outlay of money by customers who in many cases already are already financially stressed. EPA should ensure that communications are clear, informative, and targeted at the impacted customers. A broad alert to millions of unaffected people with only engender confusion and alarm rather than help the relatively small number of customers who need it. The revisions to the rule is, and the rule itself is the most complex of the Safe Drinking Water Act rules as it must balance protecting public health with the challenges associated with private ownership of sources of lead in tap water. New York City thanks EPA for its, consider its consideration and for providing the opportunity to provide these comments. Thank you. Thank you, Salome. Our next speaker will be Krista Early from North Carolina. Krista, if you can unmute your line. Um, can you guys hear me? You can. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so my name is Krista Early and I'm an advocate with Environment North Carolina. We are a state-based nonprofit dedicated to protecting our air, water, and open spaces. I represent our more than 200,000 members and supporters. I'm testifying today um, on the lead and copper rule revisions because North Carolina citizens have been dealing with the problem of lead contamination for too long. After tragedies like Flint, Michigan, we know that the toxic threat of lead in drinking water extends to thousands of communities across the country, including the communities of our state here in North Carolina. The problem of lead in our drinking water is a serious threat that can often go unrecognized Despite federal efforts to limit public exposure to lead, it continues to endanger the health and well-being of our citizens, especially our children. Lead is a potent neurotoxin and it can affect how our children learn, grow, and behave. Children are more vulnerable to lead poisoning than adults and can absorb four to five times as much lead as adults. Low level of lead exposure in children has been linked to brain damage to the central and peripheral nervous system, learning disabilities, and impaired formation and function of blood cells, among other things. Medical researchers estimate that more than 24 million children in America will lose IQ points due to low levels of lead. These problems will have lifelong impacts for the children that are affected. Environment North Carolina has worked on the issue of lead contamination for years. We have released multiple reports that have put a spotlight on this issue in our state. Current state and federal law is not adequate or expansive enough to protect our children from lead poisoning. The solution to the problem is straightforward. We need to remove the lead from our drinking water. This involves proactively removing lead-bearing parts from schools' drinking water systems, from the pipes and plumbing to the fountains and faucets. Every day, more children suffer from lead contamination. This problem continues to grow and limited action is happening. Um, we know that this is a problem and we know that we need to get the lead out. We've seen that there's an opportunity for forward momentum. Environment North Carolina supports making changes to the existing lead and copper rule to better protect our children and our citizens. While the lead and copper rule revisions call for a requirement to test for lead in their water systems, 
A better opportunity to protect our vulnerable populations is to require water utilities to fully replace all lead service lines within 10 years. The continued paradigm of testing and remediation is flawed, and we just need to get the lead out of our systems once and for all. This needs to be the same idea applied to our schools and daycare. Um, the new lead and copper rule testing program is weak. Rather, the EPA should be advising schools and child care centers to proactively replace lead-bearing parts and install filters. There is no safe level of lead in our drinking water. Today, I urge you to protect our most vulnerable population, our children, from the extreme threats of lead poisoning. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Krista. Okay, next up we have Michelle Nasirati Chapkis from Pennsylvania. Michelle, you're still muted. Would you please unmute your line? Good morning. My name is Michelle Nakarati Chapkis, and I serve as Executive Director at Women for a Healthy Environment, a Pittsburgh based nonprofit that addresses environmental exposures in homes, schools, and early learning centers. To date, the organization has assisted over 200 schools and childcare centers with the testing and remediation of lead in drinking water through our 1,000 hours a year program. Additionally, we convene a local coalition, Lead Safe Allegheny. Preventing lead poisoning prevents further environmental injustice in our communities, as we know that the percentage of lead poisoning cases among children under six tested in Allegheny County is 3.8 times greater for children of color compared to their white counterparts. Our community witnessed enforcement of the lead and copper rule in action when the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority exceeded 15 parts per billion just over five years ago. Beginning in 2017, with support from an EPA environmental justice grant, our organization mobilized and distributed thousands of water filters that remove lead in drinking water, delivered hundreds of community workshops to speak on the significance of lead in drinking water, and we continue to meet with PWSA's leadership today. We are grateful for the opportunity to further comment on the lead and copper rule revisions. After decades of gains in scientific knowledge about the sources and solutions to lead in water exposure and experience under the rule, an update is long overdue. While the proposed revision reflects some of these gains, core elements of the proposed revisions fail to consider the breadth of health-based research. An estimated 127,000 schools and 767,000 licensed childcare facilities are not tested under the current LCR. And federal funding has only been available for elementary school buildings, leaving the middle schools and high schools behind. Through the 1,000 hours program, we see firsthand the financial struggles schools and childcare centers face in environmental justice communities. In the schools we have supported, every school district had at least one building with a detectable level of lead. We know that the school and child care centers must be provided the financial resources, such as the WIN grant program, to remediate the presence of lead. After all, merely testing is not enough to address this environmental health hazard. To mitigate the confusion which arises from inconsistent action levels among local and state regulations, we believe there must be a federal standard in place. Currently, 15 states require lead testing in schools. 11 states require testing in child care facilities. Inconsistencies exist in these state regulations. We recommend the following changes. Require full lead service replacement in school and childcare facilities. Our data also shows an exceeding number of leaded faucets and fixtures that must be replaced with certified lead-free parts. Establish an action level for schools and childcare centers that reflect their vulnerable occupants, such as five parts per billion, recognizing that there is no safe level of lead. Requires schools and child care centers to communicate results, health risks associated with lead exposure, and applicable plans for remediation with families, local health departments, or state health agencies. To address the portion of TAPs permitted to have lead levels greater than the current LCR action level of 15 parts per billion, often located in environmental justice communities, we recommend lowering the LCR's lead action level to at least 10 parts per billion and requiring the submissions of lead service line replacement plans and corrosion control plans to state officials, regardless of sampling results. Declaring drinking water as safe when up to 10% of tap water samples are in violation of the action level is inaccurate and misleading to the public. Under this testing scheme, individual taps may continue to pose significant health risks for consumers. 20 we seconds, support... Michelle. I'm sorry? 20 seconds left, please. 
Further, we support a requirement for water systems to conduct complete inventories of public and private lead service lines. Impacted consumers must be promptly notified of elevated lead levels as well as upcoming service line replacements. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your comments, Michelle. Next up, we have Kathy Reiner from Colorado. Kathy, please unmute your line. Hello. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the lead and copper rule. My name is Kathy Reiner. I live in Colorado where I've worked my entire career in public health and school nursing. I'm a member of the National Association of School Nurses and a fellow with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Yeah. I'm here today to share my alarm about the current state of testing for lead in drinking water in schools and childcare and our failure to protect vulnerable children from a lifetime of disability. Yeah disabilities that are completely, easily, and cost-effectively preventable. As you're aware, lead causes the most morbidity of any other environmental toxin, and no amount is believed to be safe for children. Children under three are at greatest risk. Children living in poverty are more than three times as likely as their wealthier peers to have elevated blood lead levels, and Black children face twice the exposure rates of white children. These disparities are attributed to the places where children live, learn, and play, including their schools and child care centers. Lead is an invisible menace present in the seemingly most safe and life-giving source, drinking water. What is a solution? Well, a strong federal lead and copper rule, which not only requires water suppliers to annually test all schools and childcare settings at all drinking water taps, but also provides the funds for remediation. I have a, a quick example um, that I didn't write down, so this might be a little shaky, but here in Colorado, for, from the years 2017 to 2020, we have had a grant program, a state level grant program for schools to apply and get their drinking water tested. It, we had an annual allocation of $300,000. Um, and sadly, in the first year of the program, only 25% of that money was spent because school districts uh, failed to apply at, uh, well, they just didn't apply at a very high rate. The second year, um, half of the only half of the money was spent. And in the third year, embarrassingly, only 5% of the funds were spent. So uh, obviously here our experience in Colorado has been that these voluntary programs do not work. They do not protect our children. So I urge you to strengthen the rules in the lead and copper rule to mandate that these sources are tested. Schools are woefully underfunded and under, I guess, sourced to, to protect our children. It's, and it's a national disgrace. Thank you. Kathy, thank you for your comments. Next up, we have Alan Roberson from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Alan, you're still muted. You need to unmute yourself. How about now? Can you hear me now? Perfect, Alan. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Alan Roberson, Executive Director of the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators, otherwise known as ASTWA. ASTWA is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan association representing the state and territorial primacy agencies that are co-regulators with EPA. As such, ASTWA's members have a unique relationship with EPA when it comes to developing and implementing national drinking water regulations. ASTWA's members appreciate the time and resources the agency has expended on the LCRR, and we appreciate the opportunity for additional input. The final LCRR is promulgated on January 15th, has some areas that deserve some additional review and stakeholder engagement. ASTWA supports the delay of the LCR effective date to December 16th of 2021, as well as the delay of the compliance date to September 16th, 2024. Today, I'm repeating three issues from our previous comments. The date of the submission of primacy packages must be delayed by the same length of time as delay of the LCRR effective date. Right now it's six months, but it could be longer depending on the agency's decision. Second, the proposed delay of the LCRR compliance date says December 16th, 2024 
results in the start of the initial LCR compliance sampling to January 1st, 2025. Any potential additional LCR revisions should also result in a January 1st start of new compliance sampling. Third, ASO supports EPA in its efforts to include galvanized service lines in the final LCRR due to studies that show that a lead scale builds up on that line and that can be released and increase the exposure of lead in drinking water. However, the definitions in the current LCR are really complicated and we're just getting tons of questions about this, particularly the combinations of what's upstream of that line, a lead service line, one that's been replaced, a lead gooseneck or pigtail, and how they fit into the different plans, the inventories, the compliance sampling plans, and the replacement plans. So we need to streamline the implementation by having a, a common definition of how that applies to all the plans. In closing, I think it's important for everyone to recognize that getting the lead out through full lead service line replacement all the way to the building wall is the ultimate solution. The cost for full lead service line replacements are a shared responsibility between the water system and the property owner. And these can, costs can be a significant burden for many residents, particularly those in low income communities. Therefore, we recommend that EPA should partner with HUD and other federal agencies to broaden the spectrum of potential affordability solutions and expand existing guidance, EPA guidance, on the financial issues surrounding full lead service line replacement. And again, whatever the agency can do to more fully address these costs in the review so that additional programs can be stood up to help these low income customers for full replacement and protect our most vulnerable population. We need a clearer financial pathway for full said service line replacement. Finally, ask to intends provide additional input on LCRR issues prior to EPA's plan meeting with the co-regulators in July. You'll be seeing letters from us on a regular basis. As to appreciate the opportunity to provide this early input in the LCRR review process. Thanks. Good seeing everyone today. Alan, thank you for your comments. Next up, we have Erica Walker from Indiana. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can, thank you. Excellent. Well, let's get into it. I had too many comments, so it was tough to pull this all together. Um, my name is Erica Walker, and my background is in environmental science and public policy. I'm the Senior Director of Services at 120 Water. We're a technology and consulting company uh, based in Zinesville, Indiana. From PWSS agencies to large and small utilities across 23 states in the US, we've been helping communities find and reduce lead in drinking water and to achieve compliance with EPA's existing LCR for the past four years. And I've been working on this issue for my entire career. We wanna thank you for giving people around the country an opportunity to further weigh in on how we can further evolve the lead and copper rule from a water treatment centric policy to an outcomes based policy. The most important outcome we can strive for relative to this policy is to help communities first find and eventually replace lead service line. Flint really just revealed a fundamental flaw in the current rule, which is that um, corrosion control treatment is not ultimately a solution we can rely on to solve the problem of leaded water pipes. Policy is often about making incremental change and we're moving in the right direction. The revisions are incredibly complicated and will bring many challenges to states and utilities. So we do think a number of improvements could be made and we'll focus on three key recommendations here. So first, we think you should make the inventory requirements clearer, more efficient and more protective. The inventory should be both a tool for efficiently and effectively carrying out LCR monitoring and identifying a path to replacement long-term. Leaded fittings like goosenecks as well as copper service lines with lead solder should be included in the inventory as they can both provide dangerous levels of lead and they require the utility to take action in various parts of the rule such as the tier sampling pool. We also encourage EPA to consider requiring or encouraging environmental justice metrics to be considered in the inventory. This will give utilities a meaningful way to prioritize replacement and communities with the greatest needs. We believe these changes will save time, energy, and money in the long term as it asks utilities to take a holistic look at lead sources in their distribution systems at one time. 
Next, take action on lead service lines one step further. Validation or verification of lead service line inventory should be mandatory over a reasonable time span, say five years. This will ensure better data quality as utility records can be unreliable, and this would help utilities develop shovel-ready plans for replacement as funding becomes available. Last, make school and child color sampling really count. We suggest you extend the waiver to utilities and states where either an existing state regulation requires sampling or sampling has occurred via the WIN program. The standard just needs to line up with three T's, which is that all sources of cooking and drinking water be tested. If sampling's never occurred or, or if it was not comprehensive enough, then a utility would just need to test all cooking and drinking water sources in elementary schools and childcare facilities once within that five-year period. Testing two to five outlets could actually provide a facilities with a false sense of security about their water quality and requiring utilities to retest in states that have already leveraged the wind program to do so is inefficient. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. We wish you luck in these sessions and we look forward to seeing the fruit that we know it will bear. Thank you so much. Erica, thank you for your comments. So now we're gonna take about a 10 minute break. So come back and join at a approximately, let's say 1045, so just a little bit less than 10 minutes. In the interim, if we could pull up the slide with the docket information, just to remind our listeners. To, so to submit written comments to the docket, the docket is available at https backslash backslash www.regulations.gov. And you search docket number, if you just do uh, EPA, OW, and 0255, it'll come up, or you can type in the full number of EPA, hyphen HQ, hyphen OW, hyphen 2021, hyphen 0255. So thank you, everyone. I'll see you at approximately 1045.
Wonderful. If I could uh, invite our listeners back, please. And we'll start with Gracie Wooten from Michigan in about one to two minutes, Gracie, just so you're getting, you can get ready. Just as a reminder for, or new information for anybody who's just joined, you'll have three minutes to speak. When you have one minute left, I will turn on my camera. We have approximately 30 seconds left. I'll give you a 30 second warning. We have 10 seconds left. I'll hold up this red card to start winding down. And when your time is up, I'll cut in. Um, if you're on the phone, dialing in on the phone, I will just give you a warning, an audio, audio warning at 30 seconds and then let you know when your time is up. So with that, Gracie, we can see you. Can you please unmute yourself? You have three minutes, Gracie. Okay. Uh, thank you. My name is Gracie Wooten and um, I live in Highland Park, uh, Michigan. And uh, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, no uh, lead level is acceptable. And um, so we shouldn't be taking baby steps to um, revise the lead and copper rule. Um, older communities like mine, Highland Park, um, approximately 80% of the homes have lead service lines. Uh, people living in poverty in this community is about 45% and 14% uh, of children have tested positive for lead. Um, testing positive for lead, this. Uh, like that, you know, for our children is, uh, you know, a very uh, critical and uh, level concerning, the highest level in Michigan, in fact. Uh, we are under a uh, action level uh, for um, lead, so the, you know, there are steps being taken. Um, when the testing was done, it was like 56% um, over the um, the uh, 90th percent, the 90th percentile, you know, or 15 percent, uh, the highest level tested in one home was like 56 percent. So uh, there are steps being taken. So I think the, uh, you know, it's a foregone conclusion that in older cities um, we have led service lines. So I think the emphasis should be placed on um, figuring out how we can secure money to re help residents replace the service lines and also education, um, the water department, you know, they have, you know, put, um, they're very good about putting information in the, uh, on their website. And also they do, they've had a couple meetings, but I think there should be a national plan, you know, like that around tobacco smoking you know, uh, to let people know the dangers of lead because people don't, you, you know, uh, because you can't see it, don't realize the danger of lead, particularly to children. So I think there should be like a, a national plan uh, talking about the danger and educating the communities in, in the country about the danger of the lead exposure. I don't think it's an alarmist kind of thing to want to do this, to have a national campaign Plus, you know, states and uh, the government, maybe, you know, I was thinking about like possibly a um, something like a super fund, you know, dedicated to removing uh, lead service lines. Thank you. Gracie, thank you for your comments. Next up, we have Rachel Rimmerman from Missouri. Rachel, if you're here, if you can unmute your line, please. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for hosting this session and thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, join you all today. Um, I've enjoyed listening to many of the other comments as well. So um, my name is Rachel Wimmerman and I'm with the Water Institute at St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm also a doctoral student in public and social policy, looking at lead in water in schools. So um, 
this is something that I've been doing quite a bit of, of reading and researching about. Um, and I've been very excited to see that the LCRR has been postponed for further review and comment. Um, so while the revised rule has many improvements over the original rule, there are many areas that still need to be strengthened to better our public health. And for my comments today, I wanna to focus on just two. The first is the action and trigger levels um, we really need to establish a health-based standard in this um, legislation. And as you know, the trigger and action levels currently in the LCRR are not health-based standards. Um, experts across the board agree there's no safe level of lead in drinking water. Um, even the FDA sets their limit at five parts per billion for bottled water. The American Academy of Pediatrics um, is asking for a one part per billion action level. Um, and I think what's really interesting too is that when I talk to a lot of people about water quality, there's often an assumption that our water quality in the United States is good if it is meeting standards. Um, and when we have a standard that is not health-based, then we know that our water can meet standards but still be exposing families to lead. Um, and so we really need to seize this opportunity to, to create a health-based standard um, for lead in our drinking water systems. And the second area of primary concern is with the area of lead testing and remediation within schools. Um, that's something we've struggled with in the St. Louis area, so it really hits close to home here. Um, with the requirement in the LCRR that they test, that uh, water systems test only five outlets in each school that's being tested, that obviously leaves dozens of fountains and faucets and taps that students are still getting water from that could have dangerously high levels of lead um, and so it's leaving a lot of, of kids vulnerable in that way. Um, only testing 20% of schools per year and allowing them to opt out leaves a lot of um, students potentially vulnerable if their school either opts out or it's not their school's turn yet. Um, and we know the effects of lead are, are extremely detrimental and they're lifelong and cumulative. So um, we need to strengthen all of that and really require a lot more testing to happen um, and support the schools and the water systems in doing that as well. Um, and with um, the rule as well, not requiring high schools to test um, and high schools can opt in, I think we really need to include high schools in the uh, required testing as well because lead does have cumulative effects and it does impact adolescents and, and young adults as well. And of course, the staff and the teachers that are in these schools. So um, yeah, so just uh, wanted to share those comments with you about um, some areas that really could use some strengthening to better protect our, our students and our schools and our families and our communities as well. Thank you so much. Rachel, thank you for your comments. Next up, we have Eugene Jacques Poulet from New York. Eugene, can you, un you unmute your line, please? Oh, yes, good morning. Um, this is actually a question that I have for you folks at the EPA concerning the progress in Flint. Uh, I wanted to find out what's cooking with the existing barrier to protect against E. coli um, and how that progress is happening. And I had a question about the orthophosphates and the protective coating um, in Flint uh, uh, with the existing rule and how that's working out. So Eugene, this is this is Ryan and I am the facilitator for today's session. So today's session is structured such that it is a listening session where we are here to okay. um, listen to public comments. If you would like to send a question to EPA, I'd encourage you to go to our webpage at www.epa.gov backslash safe water and there's a dedicated email address um, for a okay. questions to EPA. So can you utilize that form? Um, would you like to make any comments or any statements related to the revised lead and copper rule today? No, I'm basically listening in. But th those were my two primary thoughts as I was going through the literature. Great, thank you. We'll have that, uh, that website up again before the um, uh, end of today's session, to, so you can go to that and you'll see the email address on that web page. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Hannah Dunart from Maryland. Hannah, please oh. unmute your line. Perfect, yeah. we can hear you. 
Great. My name is Hannah Donnert, and I am moving my. I'm testifying today on behalf of the Montgomery County Council of PTA's Health and Wellness Committee in Maryland. I'm also a mother and public health professional. I'm here to advocate for lead-free drinking water in schools and child care facilities. We urge the EPA to reconsider implementing its proposed revisions to the lead and lead and copper rule in its current form. Instead, we recommend that the EPA follow the current science and change its narrative. There is scientific consensus. There is no safe level of lead. We are asking the EPA to implement the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended one part per billion action level to prevent childhood lead exposure in drinking water. The 50 microgram per liter action level is not a health-based standard and falsely conveys a level of safety. Furthermore, the proposed LCR mandate for testing schools and childcare facilities every five years falls far, far short of protecting children from lead exposure in their drinking water. The science has shown that lead is in water fluctuates depending on a number of variables, including, but not limited to, pH, disinfectant residual levels, corrosion control, etc. A sample taken in one point in time is only a snapshot. It does not capture the full scope of the problem. Thus, applying a filter-first approach with testing annually after filter replacement for all schools and child care centers <clears throat> is a primary prevention strategy that will safeguard our children's health now. Every source is a risk, and even at the post-2014 plumbing materials that meets EPA's definition of lead-free can still leach lead. The story of my children's school district is just one of many from around the country that demonstrates the urgency in which we need to act. The 28, in 2018, our school district tested drinking water sources for lead and found alarmingly high levels. One tested as high as 1,750 parts per billion after remediation. After receiving these results, those sources that tested above five parts per billion were turned off and all the results were publicly posted. This initial testing resulted in some PTAs funding hydration stations that, were, that had filter capability for removing lead, while other schools without funding were left with unfiltered water. The lack of federal science-based equity-driven policies and practices to provide access to safe drinking water in our children's schools is furthering health disparities around our nation. There is no safe level of lead. The 15 micrograms per liter action level is not based on current science and lacks the capacity to adequately protect our children. Primary prevention through point of use filters is the only way to protect our children from permanent irreversible adverse health effects now. Establishing a federal fund to provide point of use filters and training is essential to preventing further harm from an ineffective, outdated federal guidelines and regulations. Until we get all the lead out of our surface lines, plumbing, and fixtures, a filter-first approach must be our primary exposure prevention strategy. Finding lead in, child, in a child's blood or in their drinking water is too late. The future of our children depends on regulatory action that is in line with current science on exposure prevention. We must take this opportunity to change the narrative and follow the science to provide equitable access to safe drinking water in schools and child cares throughout our nation. A law is only as strong as its weakest regulation. The LCR, as proposed, proposed is ineffective in preventing lead exposure. Make it strong, please. Adopt a filter first provision. Thank you. Hannah, thank you for your comments. Next up, we have Maritza Lopez from Indiana. And I believe, Maritza, you're coming in from the phone, so you'll need to unmute yourself. Hello, this is Maritza. Um, and I'm back. I spoke uh, last week. Um, a resident and also the chairperson of the East Chicago Calumet Coalition Community Advisory Group, the CAG of the USS Lead Superfund site. And uh, the reason I came back, I want to speak further on the lead service uh, lines, uh, copper rule, um, what I didn't get a chance to speak on. And I want to continue where I left off. Um, what my testimony on this, I'm speaking firsthand what I have learned thus far as just an individual living here. Um, and what I have been hearing, they touch base on a lot of the stuff that I wanted to speak on, but I just want to tighten it further being on the, on the USS lead superfund site, what we're dealing with. Um, we did get the uh, lead service lines replaced, but the other factor is the tap. You, you take care of the beginning line, but you still have to handle where the water's coming out. Um, and we still have the situation where the water still, when we take showers, is coming out black in a lot of the homes because of the age of the homes. Um, and that's when it hits the air. So we need to find out. And a lot of that has to do with the main water line. So the service line doesn't take care of the situation completely. So we need to make that very clear. And we, the residents, pushed to have that done. And the city 
thanks to the governor who obtained a loan, a low interest loan to EPA, the city had to cover the cost for that. Not us, the residents, because we are a brown and black, low income community affected environmental justice community that was affected by these companies in the USS Lead Superfund site. Um, the other thing I want to touch base on that the MCL EPA is to set an MCL uh, required by the Safe uh, Drinking Water Act um, for lead of 5 ppb and at a minimum, EPA must correct the rules failure to ad adequately explain why setting an MCO is not feasible, as the law requires. Um, EPA should also improve the rules monitoring and public education components to avoid underdetection and underreporting of lead contamination and to ensure that the public understands the health risk to children and what they and utilities can do to minimize them. Age requirements for children should be increased above six. EPA should also fix the flawed school and child care lead provisions. These provisions require testing of only five outlets in each school and just two in child cares. Only once in five years with no mandatory retesting. This isn't even consistent with scientific protocols and EPA's own recommendations in its three T's for reducing lead and water drinking toolkit, including testing all outlets used for drinking or cooking and shutoffs of problem outlets. EPA must promptly propose and finalize a new health protective rule and hold a public hearing on its proposal as required by the Safe Drinking Water Act. Now, as to the Superfund site, the groundwater, again, it goes back to the cleanup. Here, we still have a situation. The uh, EPA Region 5 is one of the worst in the whole nation, which also covered Michigan, uh, the Flint situation. And we have a situation here with the groundwater. Zone 1, because they divided the Superfund site, they allowed the stakeholders to divide it by consent decree into three zones. Zone 2 which is the residents there, um, they were found with uh, 1,200 ppm of lead. They were issued an emergency administrative board for cleanup after Administrator Pruitt came here, and we, the residents, spoke to him them because the, the stakeholders refused to pay for the cleanup there. Uh, zone 1 still hasn't been cleaned up. They have coming in EPA uh, found us to be like a lead smelter, the cleanup, which truly it isn't, because in our groundwater, what we have is calcium arsenate and lead arsenate pesticides that flow and do not dissolve in water. These, and this is in EPA's own files. So if there is a break in the main water line, it's coming into our homes. It's Marissa, coming into could, our basement. Marissa, if you could wind down in 30 seconds or so, please. 30 okay. seconds to conclude your remarks. What I want to let you also know, we have PCBs coming through Zone 1. Zone 1 hasn't been cleaned up. EPA is allowing the municipality to state there is no significant difference of any impact. There are residents living there. We're all getting affected over here by the cleanup. So EPA needs to do what their name stands for and do full protective uh, to protect us all. This has been going on since 1998 to present that EPA has been over reviewing this. So it is time that EPA stands up for their name and protects us all and that allows the stakeholders to handle and control EPA. And again, it goes back to what President Biden says. Um, so Marissa, years, I'm going to cut in here. So thank you so much for your comments today. Thank you. Next up, we have Hopi Fink from Missouri. Hello, and thank you to the EPA for the opportunity to comment. My name is Hopi Fink, and I'm a staff attorney at the Education Justice Program at Legal Services of Eastern Missouri in St. Louis. Our program targets the root causes of education inequity in Missouri through a racial justice lens and a community lowering model. 
We've long been concerned about the effects that lead exposure can have on children's development, learning, and outcomes in school, especially because in St. Louis City and County, 6.6% of Black children under the age of six had elevated blood lead levels, more than double the rate of lead poisoning in white children in the same region. In the St. Louis area, not only have schools failed to screen children for lead poisoning and accommodate the special education needs of lead poisoned children, some, such as St. Louis Public Schools or SLPS, have even failed to eliminate lead within school facilities themselves. Lead poisoning in St. Louis compounds the numerous challenges that students of color already face. We're glad that the LCRR requires testing in schools and childcare facilities, yet we still see some flaws with the LCRR that we request the agency review. My colleague at Great Rivers Environmental Law Center, Madeline Middlebrooks, gave public comments last week about the continued elevated lead levels in SLPS, despite a water testing action plan set at 10 parts per billion. I'm here to echo that if adjustments are not made regarding school testing, the public health crisis in St. Louis public schools will continue because the district has already exceeded the requirements in the last five years that the LCRR currently has. The rule needs to prioritize low income and minority school districts like SLPS, where students' education and health is already more likely to be jeopardized by historical and environmental injustices. We urge the agency to review, one, the mandatory testing program, two, setting a health-based action level, and three, remediation requirements. First, we have concerns that only five samples would be tested at each school. We ask the agency to align its position with the recommendations stated in the 3T testing guidelines and test all the samples, because samples can be not representative. In SLPS, there are schools that have samples testing under one parts per billion, and then at the same school, other samples with elevated lead levels. If anything, we request the agency review a percentage-based system so larger schools have more fixtures covered. We request that secondary schools and schools inside juvenile detention facilities also be a part of the mandatory testing program, as we are aware of elevated lead levels in our local juvenile detention center. Second, we seek guidance on action levels specifically for schools and ask the agency to review this section of the LCRR health-based action levels. Not giving any kind of directive leads to schools picking outdated recommendations like 20 parts per billion. And finally, for remediation, flushing should not be used as a long-term solution. A find and fix scheme should be used at schools so that eventually all schools within a building with elevated levels are replaced. And in the meantime, there needs to be some kind of remediation requirement, permissible under law, even if it is just providing bottled water. The purpose of the Safe Drinking Water Act is to protect the quality of drinking water. And if that quality cannot be guaranteed for children when they're at school, we're failing our children. And in closing, we thank the agency for the opportunity to speak about this important public health and environmental justice issue. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Sophie. Next up, we have Melanie Houston from Ohio. Melanie, if you'd unmute your line, if you're comfortable turning on your camera. Yes, how is my, do I sound like a normal person? Sound like a normal person. Oh, good, just making sure my earbuds are working, okay. Um, lovely to be with you all, thank you. And um, good morning. Uh, my name is Melanie Houston, and I speak to you today in my capacity as the Drinking Water Director for the Ohio Environmental Council. I'm also a City Council member for the community of Grandview Heights in Ohio, and a mother of two young children. In 2016, Ohio was faced with a lead and water crisis in Sebring, Ohio. The water operator had ceased using orthophosphate and lead leached into the drinking water. Residents were left in the dark for five months. The OEC worked with the Ohio EPA to pass a bill which shortened the time frame for public notification of lead exceedances from 30 days down to two days and strengthened the Ohio EPA's oversight of water systems. While this upgrade to Ohio law was significant, it did not entirely solve the problem. Ohio is thought to be second in the nation for lead service lines with an estimated 650,000 of them. Whether it's affluent communities or disinvested communities, federal, state, nor local governments have prioritized lead service line replacement. We need the federal government to set the bar so that the state and local governments follow suit. Specifically, this rule should set an ambitious target for lead service line replacement. We recommend a 10 year or less time frame. Unfortunately, under the new rule, replacement is actually slowed down from seven to 3% annually. As a city council member, I now understand why local communities have not prioritized lead service line replacement. 
With limited financial and staff resources and ample projects to tackle, this invisible problem simply doesn't float to the top of the list of priorities. The federal government can lead the way by providing clear and simple guidance for local communities paired with significant investment from the federal government. Right now, the letter and copper rule is unnecessarily complicated. In particular, the rule is structured as a treatment technique rule with an action level of 15 parts per billion. We recommend shifting the, reg the regulatory approach to lead by setting a maximum contaminant level. This would serve to simplify the rule for public water systems, local governments, and the public. At the least, we recommend that the EPA significantly lower the action level from 15 parts per billion. The CDC notes that no amount of lead exposure is safe for children. The agency must set a health-based standard. The OEC also requests that those charged with reviewing and updating the lead and copper rule pay special attention to listening to and incorporating comments from Black, Brown, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. These communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by lead poisoning and lead in water. This rule revision is taking place within the framework of a renewed racial justice reckoning in America. Every level of government and every agency bears the responsibility to tackle systemic racism and to work toward equity in all policies. Finally, we, requ we request that the US EPA center children's health in the finalization of this rule. The lead and copper rule has been ineffective for the past 30 years. With this rule update, the bar should not be improvement on the previous rule. The bar should be getting it right, which means protecting our most vulnerable, our children. Parents in America should not have to worry about the safety of the water that comes out of their taps. The lead and water crises that have occurred over history, including modern times, have dismantled the futures of children and never should have occurred. Yet the threat, threat of seriously elevated levels of lead in water remains as long as lead service lines exist in our drinking water delivery systems. Every American, every Ohioan deserves clean, safe, and affordable drinking water. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to give this comment today. Thank you for your comments today, Melanie. Next up, we have Jeff Tanner from Ohio. Jeff, if you'd please unmute yourself. Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? We can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. I'm Jeff Tanner. I own and operate Flowliner Systems in Zanesville, Ohio. For the past 20 years, we have specialized in trenchless technologies for underground utilities, including water service pipes. There are millions of lead service lines in the U.S. How long will it take before your house is next? 5, 10, 20 years? The longer you have to wait, the more your family's self is in danger. We have worked with the Water Research Foundation, had presentations for the National Drinking Water Advisory Council, and met with EPA in Washington, D.C. concerning the revised LCR, specifically about our PET expandable pressure pipe option. This product, made of 100% virgin polyethylene terephthalate, is manufactured the same as any other plastic pressure pipe, such as PVC, HDPE. It's also tested the same in an expanded standalone state with the same 50 year design life as other plastic pipes. It also resists cl chlorine and is NSF 61 certified. We are licensed to manufacture this product in the USA. Recently, EPA officials responded to us with additional questions, which has hindered this as an option in the revised LCR. Therefore, I wish to use this time as a response to the EPA. Our first pilot project was back in 2008 for Louisville Water. Our pipe was installed in several lead service lines on a residential street. We then returned almost a decade later and retested the pipes and had excellent results. This proved the longevity of our product and that it removes lead from drinking water, reducing health risks to homeowners. We have performed installations for over 10 years in the U.S. with no failures. But if need be, our trenchless pipe can be easily monitored by simply installing, installing a $3 T-fitting at the meter setting. All pipes being used in replacement programs will need to be replaced again at some point. If after 50 years our product needs replaced, we simply insert a new pipe inside the existing pipe. We can do this because the product is thin-walled but very strong. It can withstand hundreds of pounds of pressure. If a new pipe is inserted, you've added another 50 years life to your service line. Site evaluations prior to installation will be no different than digging replace methods. Therefore, there is no extra time needed for this trenchless option. These are some other advantages. 40 to 50% cost savings compared to dig and replace and additional savings depending on depth. 
eliminates health risks of high copper levels. Less intrusive to the homeowner, especially during pandemic emergencies such as COVID. No basement wall or floor breach inside of the home. Less time for insulation. On average, it only requires two and a half hours for installation. This cost saving certified and tested technology needs to be added to the revised LCR. Thank you for your time. Jeff, thank you for your comments. We are a few minutes ahead of schedule, so we are going to take a short break here in a moment. Eric Olson, I see you are on the line. If you would like to go in and give your comments now, I know we're a minute or two ahead of you, uh, of your scheduled time. If you'd like to go in and speak now, you can, or you can wait till after the break. you have a preference? Um, I'll do it right after the break. I'll give you guys a little bit of a breather. I know you've been listening a long time today, so I'll wait until after your break is fine. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So with that, we will uh, take a brief pause until approximately 1130 this morning, 1130 Eastern. So if I could invite our listeners back at, uh, at 1130. Thank you all.
Okay, we'll come back from break here. Approximately one minute if I could invite our listeners back. And Eric, I see you, so I'm assuming you're ready as well. Just give one moment for our listeners to come join. Okay, so if we could take down our break slide and we'll get started with Eric as soon as it's down. Great, thanks. So next up we have Eric Olson from Virginia. Eric, please be sure to unmute yourself. Thank you for holding these listen sessions. Um, appreciate it. Um, I've been engaged along with NRDC in the lead and copper rule for some time. We've been very engaged in specific cities, including the disaster in Washington, DC that you may remember many years ago, but also we've been involved in the litigation in Flint, Michigan, in Newark, New Jersey, administrative litigation in Pittsburgh, and we've been actively engaged in other cities, including Chicago, and working with partners in other places, including Milwaukee and elsewhere. And I wanted to compliment the agency, first of all, for reaching out to the communities that are most affected and um, wanted to urge the agency. I know you've gotten a lot of proposals for community roundtables. Um, I think it's very important for the agency um, to follow through and actually hold a, a lot of those roundtables. I know you're originally counting on just doing three to five. I think it'll be important if there are um, credible proposals coming in for more than five um, I think it would be important for the agency to go ahead and hold those, especially with remote, um, the ability to hold these remotely. I think it's going to be very important for the agency to hear from people and give them the opportunity to really meaningfully um, respond. And they've gone to a lot of effort to pull together these proposals. So I'm hoping the agency will pull that together. I, I'll just note the agency routinely meets with regulated industry, AMWA, AWWA, AWARF, blah, you know, numerous other state and local government officials and so on. And I think um, it's just such a great thing for the agency to take seriously outreach to the most affected, um, disproportionately affected communities and following through on those roundtables will be very helpful. Um, on to the merits just briefly. I know I only have a couple of minutes. Um, we strongly have urged that the agency go back to an MCL. It had one up until 1991 per lead. As you know, Cynthia Giles, the former head of the EPA's enforcement office and one of the original authors of the um, lead and copper rule in 1991, Jeff Cohen, have both suggested that the agency basically scrap the LCR and go back to a much more readily enforceable maximum contaminant level. We urge the agency to take that seriously and not sort of dispense with it out of hand as frankly, I think kind of what's done in the final rule. Assuming for the moment that the agency is not going to do that, I wanted to speak to the treatment technique itself. First of all, top priority is to have a mandatory replacement of all lead service lines within 10 years. Um, Flint and Newark have both done this. They are not exactly wealthy communities. They've been able to cobble together funding with the help of the state. Um, and surrounding communities to pay for that. A lot of other cities have done it. 
um, including Green Bay, Madison, Lansing, many others. And this is truly an environmental justice issue. So we're urging that that be front and center, along with filters um, while that um, process is going on. Um, secondly, we believe the action level should be reduced um, from 15 down to five, um, or absolutely at a minimum uh, or a maximum 10 parts per billion, the trigger level the agency finalized in January. Um, clearly that was feasible because the agency included it in the final rule. They should just make that or a five part per billion, ideally action level final. Um, need to strengthen the uh, corrosion control program with independent uh, engineering reviews of those proposals. We're urging also that the agency fix the sampling. Um, we're concerned that the fifth leader only testing not only doesn't make a lot of sense because sometimes the first leader is going to find problems, but also there's virtually no reason not to do first and fifth leader because it's very cheap once you're taking samples to go ahead and do both first and fifth. Um, for schools and daycares, you've heard from previous folks that we would urge you to push hard for water systems to encourage schools and daycares to move with filter first to install filtration stations because five tests in the school over five years just is not going to really tell much and it's going to mislead people we're concerned so moving yep. towards filters and having the utilities help with technical assistance and encourage that would be great yep. and the final couple of points um public education notification we gave many comments on this but that needs to be strengthened we've heard in city after city where we've worked that people didn't even know that they had lead problems until they read it in the newspaper um, we need better notification provisions um, and finally, um, cost benefit analysis, we're urging the agency to fix that and include things like um, cardiovascular disease and monetize those benefits, which will prove that um, obviously the stronger rules are necessitated. And lastly, of course, we're supporting the Biden uh, administration's plans for a $45 billion investment in our water infrastructure, remove all those lead service lines. We're hoping the agency is gonna be actively engaged in pushing for that. So thank you very much and um, look forward to continuing to work with you on this issue. Thank you for your comments, Eric. Next up, we have Christopher Jennings from California. Christopher, if you could unmute your line, please. Hey, how are you guys doing today? <laughs> Christopher, you're not coming through very clearly. Just be sure to speak closer to the mic if you could. It's, it's a little bit garbled, Christopher. I don't know if there's a place you can get better internet signal. We can wait a minute. We can make out what you're saying, but just barely. It sounds like you don't have a terribly strong connection. You may want to try to turn off the video. Can you hear me now? We can hear you a little better now, Chris. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you very well now. Thank you. Hey, how you doing? Okay, so you have three comments. Thank you. I'm here in Southern California. And uh, you know, it's about water lead and the plumbing and the pipes and all that defects. So, you know, it's very sad the water's filthy. We turn on the water and the faucet, sometimes it smells like, you know, the sewage. It smells like putrid, like it smells like when you're walking through certain neighborhoods and you walk down the street. Chris, Chris I'm sorry. This is wrong. I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry. To interrupt you. We're, still, we're still having some trouble hearing you. Would you try turning your video off to see if that improves your upload speed? Try turning your video off to see okay. if it allows your audio to be a little better. Okay. Thank you, Chris, and you're now muted, so be sure to unmute yourself. Hello. Let's see if this Hello. works better, Chris. Okay, beautiful. So um, I'm here in Southern California, and today's discussion is about the lead in the pipes and PFACs and corrosion. So right now we're trying to remove all these rusty lead pipes, you know, through our water system. It is important. 
like some of the neighborhoods you walk through there and there's the sewage systems and the plumbing and the pipe. You can smell, it smells like, you know, feces and sewage. It's like, it's disgusting. Even since I'm inside your home, you turn on the water, the tap, not all the time, but sometimes it smells, you know, like feces. It's disgusting. So right now we're trying to get this done and try to get this done. You know, it has to be done. It has to be implemented. We need new plumbing. It has to be done. I know we have to spend a lot of money. It's all about the environment, how we breathe, how we eat. Everything, we have to change everything. This world is just filthy, it's disgusting. So a lot of things are going to have to change. A lot of money is going to have to be spent, but we have to do what we have to do. So thank you so much for your time and your consideration. I just pray and hope that we can get things done to make you know life better for humanity. Thank you so much for your time. Christopher, thank you for your comments and thank you for working with us to be sure you had a good signal so we could hear them. Okay, we're gonna take a short break to ensure our final speakers who are not here yet have an opportunity to join. We will come back at approximately 11.50 and if they're here, we'll hear their comments and if not, we'll wrap up the meeting at that point. So thank you.
Okay. We'll come back together to close out today's meeting. So thank you everyone for your patience. We wanted to ensure that we didn't have our final speakers join us so that everyone would have an opportunity to speak today. So once again, thank you everyone for your participation today. I'm gonna to turn it over to Benita for some closing remarks. Well, I will echo my thanks to everyone. I wanna thank Ryan for um, facilitating this session. And I wanna thank my co-listeners, Anita and Jennifer for participating in this session today. As I said, when we started the session that, you know, this is our opportunity to hear directly from you about your views and concerns of this really important public health issue. So really appreciate the time that you took today to share your thoughts and concerns with us. And um, I appreciated hearing. And as we said before, you know, we're here to listen and learn. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Hmm. I'll say um, we do have another listening session today that will start at uh, 1230 p.m. If you care to listen, that will also be broadcast on YouTube as well. Just a reminder, if we could have the screen for um, the closing out screen with a docket information. So for those who would like to uh, submit written information to the docket, you can go to regulations.gov and submit that information. And the docket number is, we'll pull it up here in just a moment. Go to https www.regulations.gov and docket number EPA hyphen HQ hyphen OW hyphen 2021 hyphen 0255. With that, we'll go ahead and conclude today's meeting. Thank you.